So you want to start a reef tank. Well, you're in luck. YouTube exists, and there's about 50 million videos on how to get started. This video isn't going to be so much a step-by-step -step on how to, but rather some practical tips to think about before you get started. So I've been in this hobby a really, really long time, and this is the top five things that I wish I knew as a beginner. The first tip has to do with tank selection. Seemingly, nothing can be simpler than picking out a glass box, but there's really a lot to consider. Obviously, there's considerations such as, will it fit in the space that I've selected? You don't really need to watch a video on that type of stuff. Those things are pretty obvious. I wanted to talk about some of the technical details of tank selection and how selecting a particular tank affects everything else. So I'll start at the end and then work my way back. The best tank for a beginner ready, is a 48 inch, 120 gallon tank. So how did I come up with that? In short, it's the best combination of volume to surface area. Large volumes of water actually make the hobby easier because chemical fluctuations in large tanks happen more slowly compared to smaller tanks. The surface area part might need a practical example. First consider that one of the most popular tank sizes is a 48 inch 55 gallon tank. When you walk into like a local pet store, it's probably the first fish tank you see for sale. They're very, very, very popular, ubiquitous. They measure something like 48 inches by 13 inches front to back by 21 inches tall. And that's not a very good size because of that narrowness and that width. It limits what one can do with rock work, but worst of all, a tank like this 55 will cost almost as much as that 120 that I recommended. So how does that work? Because a sticker on that 120 is definitely going to be higher than the 55. A lot higher even. What people just starting out in the hobby don't realize is that the cost of the aquarium, that glass box itself, is basically free in the grand scheme of things. Reef keeping now, it can be done on a budget, but chances are someone that's new won't be able to easily figure out what corners can be cut. If you don't believe me, for you experienced reefers out there, how much of your original equipment do you still have? Did you spend your money efficiently those first few years? I, for one, could fill warehouses full of aquarium-related junk that I bought over the years. And now I know that I don't need them. So going back to my main point, the cost of an aquarium is basically free given the cost of everything else. That cost difference between that 55-gallon tank and the 120-gallon tank, it's really not something that you're ever going to remember. Besides livestock, the two most expensive pieces of equipment in the hobby will be your lights and filtration. And there's a good chance that the lighting and filtration that you would use on a 55 would be more than adequate for that 120. So for that tiny bit of extra cash spent on the tank early on, you end up getting nearly twice the water volume, which translates to more chemical stability more aquascaping options, and more space for fish and corals that would otherwise crowd a 55. Now I understand that not everyone has room for a 120. So for space restricted would-be hobbyists, consider tanks in two foot by two foot sections. The reason that that 120 is so efficient is that most modular lighting these days lights a two foot square. So in the previous example, Two light fixtures required to light a 55 gallon tank, which is four feet long, would easily light a 120 gallon tank that is also four feet long. If you can't fit a four foot tank, however, consider getting a 60 gallon cube that measures 24 inches on each side. Again, you're maximizing the space that your lighting and filtration can handle while giving a decent amount of volume to work with. I've glossed over filtration equipment to a large extent so far, but I'll touch on it a little bit later. What you need to remember for right now is that equipment scales well to larger tanks. For example, a medium-sized protein skimmer of any decent quality can handle most tanks from 55 to 250 gallons. Reactors scale even better. 
a typical calcium reactor can handle at least 250 gallons. Now if you decide to use dosing pumps to dispense additives, those scale to just about any size aquarium that you can even dream of. Right now, there's a lot of technology floating around that simply wasn't here 10 years ago. Things like biopellet reactors, granular ferric oxide, zeovit, heck, even LED is a relatively new technology in this industry. Someone who was in this hobby 15 years ago, that's just now getting back into it, would have a lot of catching up to do. Because there's so much stuff out there, it's understandably hard for people to figure out what's really needed. The best way that I can simplify this for people just starting out is to keep things very simple. There are really only three things that you have to provide for a successful aquarium. Those three things are good light, good water movement, and good water quality. There's plenty of debates to be had on how to achieve all of those three things, but as long as you have those three working, you'll be successful with most things. Here's a practical tip for getting started. Find a tank that you like and then copy it. Better yet, find 10 tanks that inspire your creative juices and see what they all have in common and set that as your baseline. So your journey through this hobby will be something that's uniquely your own as you figure out over time what works for you. But to get started, copy someone else's setup that you like. Let's assume that you've listened to me up to this point and you wanna do some shopping. Hold off. Hold off as long as you possibly can and absorb information. I'm going to make up some numbers here, but let's say that for every day that you spend researching this hobby, you'll save $1,000. It is that important. Rushing into things is a guaranteed way for stuff to go horribly wrong fast. You might think, but then there's so much conflicting information out there. Where do I go for good information? It's true. You're going to hear a lot of conflicting viewpoints. And what makes it even more confusing is that both people might actually be right because there's a lot of ways to be successful in this hobby. Hmm, not helping, is it? The internet is still a sea of noise. So here is a tip that can help you source better information. There's plenty of eloquent contributors to online communities that will claim some sort of expertise. And that's great. So if you want to know if they're actually legit, just look at their tank. It's as simple as that. If their tank is garbage, it doesn't matter what credentials they have as far as I'm concerned. See, a glorious tank speaks for itself, and the person that designed and then executed that will have a wealth of information on all the challenges it took to get to that point. And that stuff is simply just not taught in schools, and it's not theoretical. That has to be experienced. One way to conceptualize it is this. A great reef tank is like an iceberg. It's that thing that sticks up out of the water that you actually see. But what you don't see is that 90% or so that's still under the water. And that 90% is the hard learned lessons like tank crashes, regrettable equipment purchases, incompatible livestock choices, those janky plumbing projects, horrible electrical, the list goes on. And that's why I keep suggesting that you learn as much as you can from build threads of tanks that you really like and take from them as many ideas as possible. Okay, you've done all your homework and it's finally time to shop. The first thing I want you to do is go look outside. Is it snowing out? For those in warm areas without snow, is it basketball season? If so, it's actually not the best time to buy. Now people don't realize this, but this hobby, it's seasonal, very seasonal. Once summer hits, this whole industry almost grinds to a halt. People spend less time in the house when the weather gets nice, and it's common for there to be a little bit of neglect of the home aquarium. Oftentimes people bounce out of the hobby altogether. So if you're looking to save a bit of money on startup costs, and don't mind buying equipment secondhand, the summertime is the time to do it. If you haven't already, consider joining a local aquarium club. 
Now there's a proliferation of online communities, especially with Facebook groups, but there's still some benefits to joining a local club. Chief among those are the ability to see people's aquariums in person if that club does things like tank tours of local members and obviously purchasing equipment from fellow club members without having to deal with shipping. I've saved the best tip for last. Show Tidal Garden some love. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Share it with your friends even. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and if you want to become a patron of Tidal Gardens, hop over to Patreon and check out some of the perks for becoming a donor. Seriously though, stick around this channel for long enough and I guarantee you it'll make your time in this hobby a lot easier. But you probably wanted a real tip, so I'll give you a quick one about chemistry. Chemistry can be a really overwhelming topic and it's important that you learn as much about it as you can, but to get started consider these two things. Number one, water changes fix just about every problem imaginable. Got high nitrates because you fed too much? Water change. Corals looking stressed? Water change. Calcium, alkalinity, magnesium kind of all out of whack? Water change. Hair algae? Water change. Basically, when in doubt, do a water change. Water changes I always felt were like exercise and flossing. Uh, people tend to think that they do them a lot more than they actually do. So when people ask me about a problem that they're having, and tell me that they change water every week religiously, it's a little improbable. So why don't you go ahead and just do another one right now and see if you still have those issues. Chemistry tip number two. Don't dose any chemical that you aren't actively testing for. I get this question all the time. Should I be dosing blank chemical? Uh, I don't know. Did you test your water and was it low? Blindly adding chemicals to a tank is unwise. If you're not testing for it, don't add it. Just do a water change. Water change. All right, I hope these tips are helpful to you guys. So until next time, happy reefing.